starting a video with editing Becky. Like what is going on? <laughs> so for those of you who've seen it, last week's video that I made was all about how we measure the speed of light and how we did it in the first place and how we now know its exact value because we've defined it. Um, for those who've seen it will know what I'm talking about. If you haven't watched that video, maybe go watch it. And you'll realize that halfway through that video, about when I'm getting to sort of the turn of the 20th century, I went off on a little bit of a tangent and started talking about how we know the speed of light is a constant and also the universal limit that you cannot go faster than in the universe. And I decided to leave this for a separate video, which is what this is now. All you need to know for the start of this video is that the focus turned from measuring the speed of light to figuring out what light travels through. But anyway, I'll leave previous me to explain that. It wasn't about measuring the speed of light anymore. It was about thinking what on earth is light, an electromagnetic wave moving through, if it can move through empty space. Because waves need a medium to travel through. They need something to travel through. So ripples travel across the surface of water. A Mexican wave needs people to move around the stadium. Sound needs a medium to travel through. When it travels through air, it uses the molecules in the air to make them vibrate in order for that sound wave to travel. It's why in the vacuum of space, we always say, in space, no one can hear you scream. But light obviously can travel through the vacuum of space because otherwise we wouldn't get light from the sun. And so physicists at the end of the 19th century were essentially wondering what was the medium that filled empty space. And it was something that eventually became called ether. And so the focus really turned from measuring the speed of light to trying to detect the medium that it was moving through. Now in 1887, Michelson and Morley were trying to do just that. And they worked off Bradley's earlier concept of the fact that Earth is moving through space and that affects how light arrives to us. So the Earth is also moving through this ether. And the speed of light should couple with the speed that the Earth is moving at when it's pointing in the same direction as the Earth or when it's pointing against the direction that the Earth is going in. With and against this sort of wind of ether as the Earth moves through it. So what they did to test this was set up this huge big experiment in the basement of a dorm at Western Reserve University, which is just outside of Cleveland in Ohio in the States. They had a beam of light that was split into two, into 90 degrees to each other. And both of those paths of light were then bounced around a load of mirrors, back and forth, back and forth, before they were then brought back together, recombined and focused at an eyepiece. And when they were brought back together, the two waves would be at different points and crests if they'd traveled different paths. And therefore they would interfere with each other and give this weird interference pattern. And what they did was they floated this massive setup in a pool of mercury. And the reason it was mercury was because once they set it spinning, it would then just spin indefinitely because mercury is essentially frictionless. So if you put it in a pool of water, it would eventually have slowed down the box. But mercury, you can sort of set it going at a speed and it will stay going at that speed, nice and sort of constant. And the reason they wanted to set it spinning was so that these light waves would essentially turn through all of the possible angles with respect to this ether wind as the earth moved through it. And then what you should get is that as the block spins, again, you'd get this nice sine wave curve of a big displacement when it was against the wind and a big displacement when it was with the wind. And you should be able to detect the fact that the speed of light has been propagating at different speeds through the ether as the earth moved through it. Now, some of you will not be surprised with what I'm about to say because they didn't find it at all. It's one of the most famous negative result experiments ever. In their paper, they show sort of the predicted model of what they expected to find given, you know, the speed of light and the estimated speed of the Earth around the sun. And then they show what they actually found. And the two, they can't even plot them on the same scale because the prediction was so much larger than what they found, which was pretty much just flat within error. Like no difference, no matter what angle you measured the speed of light at. And I think Michelson and Moy get a lot of stick for that experiment, which is unfair, I think, because they were working with the, the best hypothesis they had at the time of how lights propagate. And it was almost obvious to them that that should be the case. 
But of course, when they then found their result, that was when they reevaluated and crucially changed their viewpoint on what must be happening here based on their evidence. It's not like they stuck to the idea that the ether must exist. When they found that there was no evidence, they moved on to something else. And that is so important because it allows science to move on as well. And in particular, it allowed Einstein to come in, who in 1905 proposed his theory of special relativity. It was a theory that explained why light needed no medium to travel in and that it could travel across empty space. And also that its speed was independent of the observer, which is the real crucial bit here because the Michelson and Morley experiment relied on this idea that the speed of light would add with the speed of the Earth or subtract from the speed of the Earth. And that would be the relative speed that you would measure. So for example, um, if you're on a train and you're playing catch down the aisle, then you would measure the speed of the ball, I don't know, let's say something like five meters per second as you threw it back and forth. If I was on a train next to you that was traveling at the exact same speed as your train, and I looked across and measured the speed of the ball, I would probably also measure the speed of the ball at five meters per second. But if I was on a station platform watching your train whiz past and measured the speed of the ball, I would measure the speed as five meters per second plus whatever speed that the train was moving at. But what Einstein said was that instead of a ball, if you were trying to measure the speed of light from say a laser pen, not that laser pens existed back in Einstein's day, but you get the analogy. If you were measuring the speed of the laser pen, you would measure it at the speed of light on the train. And if I was on the platform with your train whizzing past and I measured the speed of light in the laser pen, I would measure the speed of light rather than the speed of light plus the speed of the train. Now that might seem a bit counterintuitive, but that's what the Michelson and Morley experiment found, that the speed of light was invariant with the speed that the Earth was moving through space. So if light didn't need a medium to travel in, then what was actually happening for the principle of relative observers to hold? Well, Einstein in his theory of special relativity invoked some work done by Lorentz a couple of years earlier that looked at the transformation between two frames of reference, like a stationary observer and a moving observer. So that what Einstein said was that as you travel faster and as you get closer to the speed of light, time actually slows for you and lengths contract as well. For someone who is still and stationary, an infinite amount of time can pass, whereas to you traveling at the speed of light, it can feel like no time at all has passed. Similarly, a huge distance to a stationary observer like us can feel infinite, whereas to something traveling at the speed of light, it can feel like no distance at all. So it's not the speed that changes, it's the distance and the time, which might sound really strange, but if you think about it, speed equals distance over time. That's an equation that's drilled into us at high school. And so if the speed can't change for relative observers, someone who's moving and someone who's stationary, then it has to be the distance and the time. Einstein took it one step further though with special relativity and explained why the speed of light was an actual universal speed limit. And it all comes down to this idea of mass and energy equivalence or E equals mc squared. Energy and mass are pretty much the same thing. Now E equals mc squared is probably an equation that everybody has heard of. It's the most famous equation in the world, I think. I'm safe to say that. But it's actually a simplified version of the full equation because that only holds E equals mc squared when objects are at rest, are stationary. For something that's moving, you need the full version, which is E squared equals m squared c to the power of four plus p squared c squared. So there's an extra term in there, one that has the speed of light in it again, c, but also this term p, which is your momentum. So you've probably come across momentum before at high school, again in high school physics, you have p equals mv, right? Your momentum is your mass times by your velocity. So if you want to increase a particle speed, you have to increase its momentum. And to increase its momentum, you have to put more energy into a system. 
which is fine for speeds on Earth. You put in extra energy and your speed goes up proportionally. But for this relativistic equation, if you put extra energy in, it doesn't always go into increasing the momentum. In fact, the closer you get to the speed of light, the more you put energy in, the more it actually goes into increasing your mass and not increasing your momentum. So the faster you travel, the heavier that you get. This is why nothing can go faster than the speed of light. It's why it is this universal speed limit because as you reach the speed of light and as you get closer and closer and closer and closer to it, you reach the point where you have infinite mass and you can't go higher than infinity. Also, I absolutely love my necklace this week. I don't know if any of you noticed, but oh, it's like the phases of the moon and it's just so pretty. Like it's not in your face space, but it's just like, oh, did you notice my phases of the moon necklace? Um, this was sent to me by the folks at Eclectic Eccentricity who are amazing. They have this huge collection of like space and cosmos themed jewelry, which is just like, I'm like a kid in a candy store when I go to their website. I'm just like, I just want it all. So if you're struggling for Christmas presents for someone who loves space and jewelry, then this would be the place to go because oh, their stuff is just gorgeous. My earrings are from there too. Also, little moons. Can't get enough. Cannot get enough. Seriously. Traveling at the speed of light. I'm gonna be an infinite mess over you.